How many people have been killed by the atomic bomb? Estimates range from about 100,000 people to about 230,000 people. But it's really hard to calculate. Plus, what if you consider not only the initial blast and the firestorm that comes with it, but also the people who would succumb to radiation sickness or related injuries in the following days? Then, how many people later develop cancer because of the fallout? How many people didn't lose their own lives but lost everyone in their lives? How many people had their livelihoods irrevocably destroyed by the atomic bomb? That number is so much bigger, almost impossible to calculate. Perhaps you saw the movie Oppenheimer, where there's a scene where two characters discuss this exact thing. The interesting thing is, though, they only discuss Japan. Of course they focus on Japan. That's the only country that's ever had another country's nuclear weapons deployed against them. But the casualties start before Fat Man and Little Boy, and they last long after Hiroshima and Nagasaki as well. It's just before dawn on the 16th of July, 1945. J. Robert Oppenheimer and the scientists of Los Alamos, New Mexico are about to conduct the Trinity Test. It is the first nuclear detonation in human history. The test site and laboratory location were selected because they were remote. Dozens and dozens of miles of inhospitable desert between the test site and civilization. That way, it would be easier to keep the project a secret from prying eyes, and the test site was ideal because it was empty, flat, desolate, with predictable wind patterns. A few years prior, as World War II is heating up for America, in June of 1942, the U.S. government combines its nuclear testing attempts into the Manhattan Project. In charge of the operation are Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer and Brigadier General Leslie Groves. Oppenheimer is a civilian scientist with a degree in theoretical physics, controversial political leanings, and an obscenely good education. General Groves, the Army Corps of Engineers officer who oversaw the Manhattan Project, is a bigger fellow with a prominent mustache and his own background in engineering, in addition to having a stuffed resume of military postings. Oppenheimer and Groves originally estimate that the Los Alamos Laboratory could be staffed by between 100 and 300 scientists and technicians. At the end of 1946, however, the population of Los Alamos soared to 10,000 scientists, technicians, engineers, and their families. They assembled the Avengers of nuclear physicists that included now famous names like Enrico Fermi and Richard Feynman, and were able to successfully build Gadget, as it was called at Los Alamos. Originally trying to create a gun-type weapon known as the Thin Man, and eventually refocusing to a much more complex implosion device. Several test sites were in consideration for where the Trinity test would take place, including New Mexico, Colorado, Southern California, and Texas. Ultimately, a site on a mesa near the Tularosa Valley in New Mexico was chosen. Land was then acquired by the government, grazing rights were suspended, and locals were hired to build the town around the labs. The scientists worked tirelessly. The origin of Trinity Test's name is the subject of some debate, but Oppenheimer himself suggests that it came to him through a John Donne poem, Holy Sonnet Number 14, which contains military imagery, suggesting that Oppenheimer was fully aware of the danger of what he was building. In fact, Oppenheimer was far from excited about what he was building. Most historians would characterize him as a man of dispassionate duty. His country has called for his aid, and he will answer. We're not going to pretend to understand the science that made the gadget work, and that's not really the story we're telling here anyway, so we're going to skip through most of that. In the weeks before the Trinity test, a 100-foot shot tower was built in which to detonate the gadget. They were looking for ideal conditions in which to detonate the test gadget. Clear weather and gentle westerly winds high in the atmosphere. The detonation was originally planned for 4 o'clock in the morning, but it was delayed due to heavy rain and a thunderstorm, which scientists worried would increase the danger of nuclear fallout. Physicist Enrico Fermi told Oppenheimer due to the storm, there could be catastrophe. Oppenheimer disagreed, saying, the weather is whimsical. The test would proceed. An hour and a half later, at 529 in the morning, just before sunrise, they produced a successful explosion, and the Trinity test was complete. 
The fireball and mushroom cloud went way higher than anyone expected. 50,000, maybe even 70,000 feet into the air. The explosion was so hot that the sand in the desert was melted into a green glass, later called trinitite. The sky was lit up brighter than daytime, and the heat was reported to be as hot as an oven. A few weeks later, the first atomic bombs would be dropped on Japan, effectively ending World War II. Oppenheimer famously ruminated on the destruction he was about to create. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Manhattan Project historian William L. Lawrence remarked that it felt like a biblical experience. There arose from the bowels of the earth a light not of this world, the light of many suns in one. It was as though the earth had opened and the skies had split. One felt as though one were present at the moment of creation when God said, let there be light. It's just before dawn on the 16th of July, 1945. J. Robert Oppenheimer and the scientists at Los Alamos, New Mexico are about to conduct the Trinity test. It is the first nuclear detonation in human history, but in the years prior to the actual test, the entire town of Los Alamos was built from the ground up. The land for Los Alamos was taken from New Mexican citizens. 3,200 square miles confiscated from mostly indigenous and Hispanic farmers through eminent domain. People saw their homes bulldozed and much of their livestock just set free. Many of the Hispanic homesteaders were compensated for their land at much lower rates than the white homesteaders, and some received nothing at all. Many of these people were then bused to the lab site where they could be hired for only the most menial tasks, building the roads, janitorial work, mining the uranium for the Manhattan Project. Even the McDonald Ranch House, the modest farm home in which the gadget was actually assembled, was taken against the will of the McDonald family who had lived there for 30 years and later sued the government for tens of thousands of dollars. The Trinity test site and laboratory location were selected because they were remote, but they were not as remote as they needed to be. In fact, it's hard to imagine any landscape as remote as it would have needed to be to avoid casualties. The Tula Rosa Basin was not this mass of worthless, uninhabited desert that's often been portrayed. There were people who lived near the Trinity test site. In fact, half a million people within a 150 mile radius of the test site, with some families living as close as 12 miles away. It was a rural area where people lived off the land, primarily ranching and farming. When the Trinity test happened, people lived close enough to see the flash, to feel the blast, and to hear the explosion. Windows at a bar in Silver City, a whole 180 miles west of the bomb, broke due to the explosion. Paul Pino, who lived about 40 miles due east of the Trinity site, woke up to the sky burning bright as daylight. Some people thought it was the end of the world, he said, and they started praying like crazy because they thought the sun's coming up on the wrong side of the world. It was that bright. Henry Herrera, who wrote his testimony down at 81 years old, said he watched the mushroom cloud for hours, moving only to use the bathroom and eat. He watched as it ballooned into the sky, and then noticed that the black and gray ball of smoke began to move back toward his house. He rushed in to warn his parents, who watched the cloud come back toward the Tularosa Valley, and then blanket their homestead and town with ash. His mother was upset because she was going to have to rewash the laundry that had been hanging on the drying line. Everything around them was contaminated. A teenage camper named Barbara Kent ran out of her cabin, noting that the sky was so bright it hurt their eyes. She initially thought that it was a hot water heater explosion, but saw the mushroom cloud and noted how strange the sky looked. In the morning, Barbara and the other kids saw what looked like snow falling from the sky white flakes coming down, which they caught on their tongues and played in it like it was a winter snowfall. They noted that the snow was hot, which they attributed it to being summer. Of course summer snow would be hot instead of cold. We were only 13, she said. We didn't know any better. This hot snow, which was actually radioactive nuclear fallout, continued to come down.
for days. Barbara Kent was the only one of the friends on the camping trip who would live to the age of 30. One family in Oscuro, New Mexico, hung bed sheets in their windows to protect their house from the flakes. It coated everything like a blizzard. Soon after, their chickens died. Then their dog died. Cattle were found dead in the fields with burns on them, and people began to find green glass in the desert. We now know this to be trinitite, a radioactive glass that was caused by the Trinity test superheating sand. People didn't realize it was radioactive, and some people would collect it, taking it home with them, where it further irradiated them. The scientists at Los Alamos knew that the bomb would produce radiation, but they vastly underestimated how much. Some scientists believed that the blast would be like a few tons of TNT exploding. Some guessed that it would be like uh, 45 tons of TNT. Some even guessed that it wouldn't go off at all. But none of them guessed that the blast would be the payload equivalent of 15,000 tons of TNT, giving off heat 10,000 times hotter than the surface of the sun. Those numbers are so insanely high, we had to read them several times to make sure we were reading that correctly. The mushroom cloud would be many times taller than predictions, reaching a full seven miles into the sky. If you had been standing on the moon, you would have been able to see the explosion with your naked eye. More than 100 miles away from the blast site, scientists found disturbingly high levels of radiation in the days after. In Carrizozo, New Mexico, southeast of Albuquerque, scientists measuring radiation levels with Geiger counters saw that they were off the charts. Their instruments literally couldn't read any higher. Some film badges designed to detect and measure radiation were sent to nearby post offices before the test, but instructions were woefully inadequate in the name of secrecy for the project, so nobody really knew how the badges were meant to be used or why, causing them to be deployed incorrectly or not at all. The government also, of course, lied about the explosion. They claimed that the blast was the result of an explosion at a munitions dump. And they even had fake obituaries of scientists drawn up to submit to the press. But people who lived in the area know that only some of the people believe the story. When the bombs were actually dropped on Japan two months later, people put the puzzle pieces together quickly. It makes sense that the Unit S government wouldn't be fully forthcoming with what actually happened, but they refused to take necessary precautions, even with the cover-up. James Nolan, a radiologist for the Manhattan Project, came to General Leslie Groves, the character that Matt Damon plays in Oppenheimer, and told him that the blast was a probable threat to civilians. General Groves' response was to get genuinely sore at him for bringing it up. Groves did not seem concerned about safety, Nolan says. Physicist Joseph Hirschfelder made calculations about fallout distribution and warned Dr. Oppenheimer that the radiation might make the roughly 40 square miles around the test site completely uninhabitable. He was ignored. In towns like Carrizozo, a few scientists warned that residents should be evacuated. They even had cattle trucks at the ready to load people into. However, the radiation levels went down after a couple of days and people stayed. Modern readings note that some homes in the area of the blast had 10,000 times the levels of radiation that are currently allowable in public areas. While the Trinity site was chosen for its predictable winds, downwinder Paul Pino notes that locals call the area near the Trinity site the Four Winds because there are high, unpredictable winds around. The locals are right. A 2023 study shows that the fallout from the Trinity test likely reached 46 states within 10 days of detonation, with the greatest portion settling about 30 miles away from the test site. Manhattan Project Chief Medical Officer Stafford Warren reported to General Groves that five days after the blast, there was still a very significant radiation hazard within an incredibly large 2,700 mile area downwind of the test. Nobody was evacuated. The people of New Mexico continued to feel the effects of the Trinity test in the months and years afterward. Those who lived in the area had the fallout reach them by it moving downwind and became known as the downwinders. They didn't know about the contamination to essentially every aspect of the land they were living off of, so they gradually got radiation poisoning. 
Downwinder Paul Pino says that they got it through the water, through the milk, through the eggs, through the chickens that they'd slaughter and eat. They do hunting, they get it through the deer, the rabbits. Downwinder Tina Cordova says that the radiation would go on everything, went everywhere, the soil, the water. Everything they were eating or drinking in 1945 after the test was contaminated, but they didn't know it. Infant deaths spiked in New Mexico by more than a third in the months after Trinity. Paul Pino estimates that the infant mortality rates should actually be much, much higher though, because many of the babies at the time were born and then died at home, where their brief lives weren't ever publicly recorded. The officers and scientists of the Manhattan Project did not feel these effects nearly as acutely as the downwinders. In fact, some of the scientists considered themselves just awfully damn lucky that the fallout hadn't been worse. Scientists were told to lay down on the ground, head facing away from the blast, to not look at the flash directly, and to stay prone until the blast wave passed them. The half million people in the nearby area, of course, were given no directives. In fact, preparations for monitoring the nuclear fallout were as much about defending against litigation as they were about protecting health. Monitors were given directives to keep as complete notes as possible in your own handwriting. These notes can be written up more fully at a later date, but in any court proceeding, it is necessary to have your original data. Stafford Warren said, No one really wanted to pursue the radiation possibilities for fear of getting involved in litigation. The army and government lawyers wanted to put it all out of sight and mind as quickly as possible. Doctors noted that civilians had been probably overexposed, but they couldn't prove it. According to Los Alamos health director Louis Hempelman, and we couldn't prove it, so we just assumed that we got away with it. Two studies from the Los Alamos National Laboratory and the National Institutes of Cancer showed that there were high levels of radioactive material in the Trinity Zone as late as the 1980s, and that hundreds of people probably got cancer from it. They haven't really been acknowledged by the public, let alone compensated. People are only allowed to go to the Trinity test site twice a year, in April and in October. And there is a monument there, but it commemorates the gadget itself, not the people who were affected by it, Americans or Japanese. In 1990, Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which provides $50,000 to people who may have been exposed to radiation from nuclear tests. While most of the payments have gone to military and government workers, there are downwinders who have received payouts from the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. But those payments have gone to people in Nevada, not New Mexico. Tularosa Basin downwinders were left out of the original bill entirely. An amendment to the act would cover people who were alive during the Atomic Age, specifically 1944 to 1962, and have been diagnosed with one of 14 radiogenic cancers. But when Cordova was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in her 30s, the first thing they asked was if she worked with radiation. The fact that she lived in a community just 45 miles from the Trinity test site was not asked. She's the fourth generation of her family to get cancer. The amendment has been introduced 16 different times in Congress, but it's never passed. Payouts to the amendment would amount to about $5 billion a year, but that's just one-tenth of what the U.S. spends yearly to maintain our nuclear arsenal. Tina Cordova is a central figure for the Downwinders now. She's the founder of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium and a sixth-generation New Mexican. She got thyroid cancer as a result of the Trinity test fallout, as we previously noted. Two of her great-grandfathers died of stomach cancer. Both her grandmothers got cancer. Her mother got mouth cancer. Her father had prostate cancer and tongue cancer. Since its founding in the mid-2000s, the TBDC has been fighting for public acknowledgement and payment in regards to the test that has ruined so many lives. If you read through the testimonies from the organization, people provide not only their stories, but lists upon lists of friends, neighbors, and relatives who have developed cancers. It is staggering. Before dawn on the 16th of July, 1945, 
J. Robert Oppenheimer and the scientists at Los Alamos, New Mexico, are about to conduct the Trinity Test. It is the first nuclear detonation in human history. In pursuit of a swift victory in the war, America is about to bomb itself. Using the atomic bomb as a weapon to end World War II might have ended the war more quickly, but we'll never know. In school, we were always told that there was absolutely no way Japan would ever surrender without a hideous show of force, but we've never actually been shown compelling evidence to support that idea. Using the atomic bomb as a weapon might have been important in demonstrating the extremely devastating power of the atom so that people would appropriately fear its power and not use it again anytime soon, as Dr. Oppenheimer thought. But the casualties of those bombs aren't really our point here. The thing we want you to take away from this is the undertold story of the Tularosa Basin downwinders. The casualties that came before the Enola Gay ever took off from the tarmac, and the casualties that the U.S. government has never acknowledged. Tina Cordoba says they'll never reflect on the fact that New Mexicans gave their lives. They did the dirtiest of jobs. They invaded our lives and our lands, and then they left. Luckily, that seems to be changing. In August of 2023, while we were writing this, President Biden signaled that his administration is open to providing assistance to the Tularosa Basin downwinders. New Mexico Senator Ben Ray Lujan says that those families did not get the help that they deserved. They were left out of the original legislation. We're fighting with everything we have. The Senate has voted to expand compensation to Trinity Test downwinders in a bipartisan bill. While this is not a happy story, this is certainly a positive development. Sadly, the better part of a century too late. With the new legislation and the Oppenheimer film, hopefully the story reaches more ears. The extent to which America nuked itself is not completely appreciated still, to this day, by most Americans, especially younger Americans. Just before dawn, on July 16th, 1945, J. Robert Oppenheimer, and the scientists at Los Alamos, New Mexico, conducted the Trinity Test, detonating the first nuclear weapon in history. The gadget rained ash down on countless lives in 1945 and would touch every generation afterward. The fallout continues 80 years later. By the way, we went to Los Alamos and we were excited to see the Project Gate. This thing is a public restroom. That's all it is. It's just a facade for a bathroom on a cliff. Mm.